Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, we are uh, very excited to be here and share a little bit of what work we do uh, back in Toronto at Food Share. Um, so my name is Wynette and this is Nico and we have Emmanuel here um, who just started with Future and this is her first week and kind of road trip to, uh, <laughs> to Belleville. Um, so at your tables we have a few things that we've set at your tables and you're, we're gonna, I see some of you are, you know, have been smelling a little bit and that's great. Um, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about that as we go along. Uh, but we have a little bit of things that we sh that we do in classrooms that we share. We will share a little bit of a snippet with you, um, and yes. Yeah, so basically, this is how the next hour is going to look like. We'll do an introduction of growing in the classroom um, and some different options. So uh, we're looking at a new pilot project that we've been working on the past year, and which is using growing towers. Um, as well as some traditional growing options with outdoor plant uh, gardening, as well as some quick alternatives too um, that are quick and easy things using simple ingredients, basic ingredients, um, and we'll end with a uh, question and answer as well. Okay, great. All right, um, welcome everybody. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do at FoodShare. We do a lot of things, um, that's for sure, but we primarily focus, there's, there's many teams in our organization, and one of the teams that we primarily work with is called Field to Table Schools, and that's within the educational department at FoodShare. So FoodShare, as an organization overall, we work with communities and schools uh, to deliver healthy food and food education. And that includes whether we're working in schools, whether we're working with community centers, whether we're working with the city from a policy perspective. Um, and our major goal or our, our mission is to be able to deliver healthy, fresh, and nutritional food um, for part of our catchment area, which is the GTA. Um, oh, did I skip that? Sorry. Yeah, um, so as part of the field to table schools, we have many different programs and one of the programs that we're constantly working in right now is, uh, it's called um, the, um, sorry, the Good Food Machine. And the Good Food Machine is essentially what the growing towers are. How many of you have heard the term hydroponic? Just raise your hand. Wow, okay, everybody. That's great. Um, so we've been, gr we've been essentially doing a lot of work um, in schools and out of schools, so meaning with teachers in schools, but with also ec uh, community educators at community centers. Um, and we've sort of analyzed and transitioned uh, of what we've learned for the past year and how we're taking that in the future. So we'll be speaking a lot of that um, as part of our capacity at FoodShare. So before we get into that too, we're going to do a quick activity with you. And this is part of our um, food uh, media and marketing lesson that we have that's uh, on available online as well. Um, so it's name that brand, name that food. We're going to do a kind of like just a shout out as you see it. So here we go. Okay. So um, we're just going to name or shout out these popular food brands. Brands, maybe starting from the left. Craft, okay. Campbell. McDonald's, yeah. Uh, I think that one's Burger King. KFC, okay, all right. Good. Next. Okay, how about these popular convenience foods? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Kraft again, Tin Bits, McDonald's, Subway, yeah. Okay, right. how about these logos? Okay. Next. Okay. Celery root. Okay, so I heard cel celery root on the left, yeah. The middle one is a daikon radish. Yeah, and uh, the one on top is uh, their soybeans, and the last one, kale. Yeah, cool. So not not bad. Really not good. Bad, <laughs> <bad>. <laughs> Next. Okay. 
So very close. So mulberries on the top, uh, kiwis, and uh, apricot. Yeah. Cool. And was that it? All right. How about these plants? Garlic scapes, yeah. And on the right? Strawberries, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, garlic scapes. The scapes, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Awesome. So you get an A+. Plus. <laughs> you did pretty good. But um, uh, like when we usually, so usually when we do these type of, uh, this type of activity with students, of course, a lot of them get the first three slides in seconds. But when it comes to the fruits and vegetables, they have no idea, right? And so this is the reason that we're in schools, in classes, doing the type of work that we do, um, and the reason that you're all here as well. So that's a quick fun activity that you yourself can do, um, and it's readily available online on our website, so we can share more information about that. And okay, so in terms of different alternatives about growing, um, so there's the hydroponic or aquaponic growing options, um, and that's a quick and easy way to start uh, start growing in your in your school, um, you know, all year round throughout the winter. Uh, the one that we're using right now is, so this top, uh, sorry, the bottom right picture. And we have some pictures on your table as well, so you could have a look at how we've, uh, we've been using them in the classrooms. Um, but with that one, you can grow up to 28 uh, plants in the tower garden, so throughout the year. We've been doing, we've had a lot of success with different types of leafy greens and herbs. Um, some fruiting vegetables, depending on kind of like the environment in your school, classroom, like is it pretty humid, is it you know, cold, is there a nat window for natural light? Um, so fruiting vegetables do grow in the towers as well um, and do very well at the bottom of the tower. Uh, they're, they're hydroponic, so there's no soil. Um, there's a medium called rock wool, uh, which is like this fibrous material that's uh, spun through a machine really fast and, ma uh, and made into this fiber, kind of like an insulation type of material. Coconut fiber? Uh, we haven't used coconut fiber, but they are also kind of like, there are different types of plugs. So if you see hydropon like if you, uh, hydroponic stores, they have a lot of different types of things, even little clay pellets as well that are called hydrogen. Um, so here, I'll just do that, thanks. Um, so yeah, the aqu aquaponics and hydroponics, some of you may have, even have, do any of you have um, fish or an aquarium in your classroom? Yeah, that's cool. Um, so we do have a online resource as well that's called the Veg Aquarium. So if you wanted to actually set up sort of like a clue, it's called like a closed loop system or a symbiotic system where the fish and the plants um, sort of, they benefit from each other. So the water is recycled um, and the plant food, the fish use the plant food and then it's recycled to the process of like making algae and the bacteria that forms on the water. So pretty cool kind of like, you know, s for the science teachers or um, anyone who's interested in life cycles and things like that, that's a pretty neat way to um, introduce students to, um, to animals and fish. Um, there are different types of kits. So the one on the left is the one that we're using right now. Um, last year we started at 10 pilot schools in Toronto. Each school received two tower gardens. Um, and so we went in through with them with from building the tower to you know going through how the system works um, how the plant uh, gets the air water and all the nutrients that they need um, from this system and looking at tradition the way that plants get that traditionally um, so there's some different units and just some ideas for you in terms of price lists you know some of them are pretty uh, heavy and if you don't uh, costly I mean but and if you don't have funding for program it's it's difficult but there are some uh, s low scale and higher scale uh, prices there. Um, but also there are a lot of easy, simple DIY setups that you could use using um, plastic bottles. Um, so something like uh, the one at the bottom here is very simple and easy to do, whereas the one on the t uh, right is a little bit more co complex with the water pump and things like that uh, set up. Uh, you can have the bottle, you know, um, hanging sort of horizontally or vertically, um, and it also just maybe makes an area look 
nice too just to have these plants growing and for students to be able to uh, exper experience them. Um, but again, it's, you know, it is the use of plastic. Um, if uh, in the first place we could reduce the use of plastic, that'd be great. But if you're finding that um, you know, maybe students are bringing in plastic bottles, there's a, an, a way to sort of recycle them and use them for growing. Uh, so this is another option called the Kratky hydroponic method um, that this professor created a sort of a non-circulating hydroponic system that doesn't use electricity um, and it's fairly cheap to implement from fif say 50 to 200 dollars so it's more of like a container type of self uh, irrigated planter so you know you get those ones where you can add the water in and as the plant the plant uses it up uses up the water as it needs it Sure. Uh, so they do have, they come with their own light system. So like they're like four um, ultraviolet uh, lights, light bulbs, and they sur sort of surround the lights, yeah, uh, the plants, sorry. Um, so yeah, so very, you could do, you know, start up something really small scale, uh, depending on s the type of space that you have, of course, and I'm sure in your classrooms there isn't quite a lot of space, but you know, th it's very easy to start something small. Um, and then here are some YouTube resources, and we'll make this presentation available to folks so you can have this uh, information for yourself too. And yeah. All right, um, so as, as part of the vertical garden, we also do a lot of traditional outdoor growing methods. and. This includes uh, some schools may get the vertical, um, the the tower garden, but uh, some other schools they they may also get a bit of a mix in between outside and inside. So, especially within schools, <coughs> uh, it's making the connections in, for instance, how are the plants growing inside versus how are they growing outside, and then you can make those connections in many many different ways and how you apply it in curriculum, whether it is in math, science, art, and so forth. So uh, this is actually a picture of one of the schools that um, was trying out a, a bit of mixing in between. So they had a tower garden inside the school, but they also uh, purchased this four, four or five um, sort of like growing pots. Um, and we were comparing sort of the differences between Primarily leafy greens like lettuce, spinach, arugula, mizuna, which is it's a Japanese-based uh, leafy green, and and trying to expose them as well into the different tastes. Whether it tastes differently, some of them they said it tasted differently between indoor and outdoor. Uh, but those are like some compares like considerations to take, especially when when working with students. Um, so yeah, so vertical outdoor growing. Hydroponic is one system which requires a pump and or hand held um, watering. But there's many other uh, applications and benefits with vertical towers. So one of them being that you, if you don't have a lot of space, then you can use wall space, right? So for instance, uh, some of the pictures here, this is just to showcase, but some of the pictures uh, using plastic bottles that we showed in previous uh, slides. Uh, but making use of, of walls, making use of fences, making use of any vertical space that is non-used, and you can activate your students in either helping you build that or, or activate them in, in uh, just tracking the progress of how the plants grow. Um, this is the other one. So yes, making use of change, especially around schools, that's fairly common. Um, and some of the 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 foods that grow is beans, peas, cucumbers, anything that has more of that root structure, um, uh, or sorry, vine structure, uh, crawlers. So they definitely make a way, a good way for children to get active, as well as like understanding how they grow up or how they behave. Um, and. So these raised bed gardens, um, like I mentioned in the, in the beginning, we, we use it a lot in the mix between vertical hydroponic gardens and out, outdoor gardens. So 
it's also beneficial in a way to reconnect students into the outdoors. Um, so for instance, there are certain considerations with the hydroponic garden, which you don't get a lot of biodiversity in it, which means you don't see a lot of bees, you don't see, um, uh, you don't see wasps, you don't see a lot of these like pollinator animals um, that you would normally get outdoors. Um, so reconnecting them outside helps uh, for them to also get exposed to, to how plants grow and the pollination process and so forth. Um, and that's another interesting fact, which is being able to identify, um, especially inside, you would have to hand pollinate the tower yourself or with students, whereas outside, nature does it for you, right? Um, again, raised bed gardening. So put in a structure overall the, the garden beds, so minimizes uh, pests. Um, with the, with the hydroponic towers, you won't have as much as pests inside the classroom, let's say if you were gonna use it inside the classroom. Um, but there are certain considerations as well if you're bringing plants from outside in, you might wanna be careful of not bringing pests in because then the, the plants in the tower garden do not have those, like I said, the, the, the little bees and wasps and ladybugs that would protect it. So you wanna be careful of that. But outdoors, you could do something like this, which is having a mesh outside and it'll minimize your, your risks of pests. And you may see this in the past, you may do it yourself already, which is uh, season extension. So doing a bit of more of like a mini greenhouse um, and extending the lifespan of many of the, the fruits or veggies that you're growing in schools. Uh, So there are different things that you could have um, them sort of uh, strike the bed, plant certain things in it, and then, oh, sorry. Uh, so there are certain things that you could, yeah, have them plant and then come back uh, during, after summer. Um, and this is actually interesting. Uh, I'll, ref I'll reference the middle picture, and this is the same school uh, that we worked with. Um, and is using unused material. So for instance, milk crates, uh, using buckets, using uh, whatever surface material you can house for soil. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a great way to get students involved. Um, uh, for instance, so the middle picture, what we did is we actually use a PVC uh, food safe pipe and what we're doing here is sort of we're replicating the vertical tower, but um, we're just using soil instead, and then throughout their school year, they would have to use either a hose from the top and then uh, water from the top, which is sort of drained down, um, and then you would get food that way. So it's, it's maximizing the use of the space and maximizing how you would work with students. So this is a, a high school where they were, they were able to actually build it themselves, cut it, use tools, um, and, and pretty much just let them do as much as possible so for them to get that experiential learning, their hands in the soil, and so forth. Um, and on the, on the left as well, you can use as much as uh, containers as possible with, um, you can grow, we've, we've grown peppers, uh, you can grow tomatoes as well, and then sort of create a structure for the students to be involved and be also exposed uh, to new foods, if anything. In, in terms of like container gardening, sorry, container gardening and um, raised beds, that you know, that's sort of like a system that would work when you're also you're just not sure about the quality of the soil, um, so th that you can have these contained um, uh, spaces where you could you know add the soil and add the materials that are required. Oh yeah, and um, I know it's a lot of information, um, so we're gonna take a bit of a break, and I'm gonna show you something that we normally use as well in schools. 
Um, and so what we have here is we actually use, we do a lot of composting at FoodShare. So we, we have a couple people who work primarily full time as, as uh, compost. And this bin is one of the 12 or 13 bins which has uh, worm composting. So inside this bin, there's worms. And then in different periods, like six, uh, 14 stages, um, at the end of those stages, you, we would harvest the final compost of the worms, um, which is the worm castings right here. And this makes uh, a great lesson plan for students to also become involved into how soil is made, right? So I know we have a big group, so most likely not a lot of you would see this, but I will welcome you after this presentation to come by and check it out, smell it. Um, if you feel adventurous, dip your hand in it and get to see the worms. Um, but this is something that you could use also with a container gardening. So meaning that it's not only about it's not only about uh, growing food, but it's also about sorry, but it's also about like there's a lot of waste in schools, right? And you can make a great lesson plan. Um, of utilizing a lot of the ways, let's say from here, from sessions, from um, school cafeterias, and, and including it as part of uh, making your own compost or bringing worms in so that you have a bit of a, um, another external activity with students. Okay, so just some alternative growing options um, in the classroom. So. What we did is we, st uh, I think so earlier this week, we started um, sprouting some seeds. Um, and some of you may have come up and had a look at them, but do, does anyone know, have an idea or some guesses as to what kind of seeds, seed this might be or sprout? Radish, any other? Yeah, the sprouts, what's that? Alfalfa, what's that? Broccoli, okay, so a lot, yeah, so you could use a lot of different, uh, you can use a lot of different seed for sprouting, but these ones here are sunflower sprouts, um, and they're at each of your table as well. Um, so this is a really, really quick and easy way uh, to get students excited about growing. Um, and you know, oftentimes they're very familiar with the large, big sunflower, um, you know, f the flower and everything, and it's really um, awesome to see the amazement when they realize like this is the starting of the sunflowers uh, plant. Um, so they're very, the benefits of uh, sprouting, um, they're, you know, they're very high uh, in protein and vitamins. Um, and so this is a really easy way to get students to taste test uh, things as well and become familiar with different types of uh, food and plants that they might not normally uh, be uh, used to. Um, and it's quick, it's quick and easy, right? So uh, again, so just in terms of nutrient, power, power foods, I guess you could say, they c you could call them a superfood. Um, and uh, they're not very well, um, I guess, known, but they're amazing um, ways to get kids to eat nutritious food or even just snack, uh, snack, yes. Uh, so it takes, uh, for a fully, sort of fully grown, um, it takes about seven to ten days, and uh, not long at all. Yes? Uh, no, not that Maybe I know of. Like raw, non, like toasted sunflowers, so you want to be able to have, to get s seeds that are, uh, that are in their raw state. Um, and it just takes a, about a week. So uh, we've done workshops where you plant with students that the, let's say one week and then the following week you harvest them and then you eat all together. So that's kind of the, the, the initial plan or the lesson plan I would say. Yeah. And, uh, and as part of that with starting them, sorry, starting them off from seed, um, you know, you could talk to students about the plant cycle and the different, the plant parts um, and that's a really awesome lesson too. And so uh, 
one of the ways that we do this is like we started them off in two trays and we kind of you can have them stacked and what happens is with s with a plant like sunfl the sunflower because it grows pretty uh, big and hardy um, is that the weight of the tray allows the plants to get stronger and they kind of like push up um, and then uh, you would be spraying just spraying them lightly with water daily um, and then just leaving them out sort of at a windowsill um, so that they can get some natural light as well. If you guys have any questions, just pop your hand up. Yeah. Um, so another way uh, to get uh, students uh, excited about growing and eating too um, is just uh, you know getting growing food from scraps. So things like um, you know the tops of carrots or the root of the carrot. Um, some really good foods that you could try are things like leeks and onions, the lemongrass, celery, um, lettuce, ginger, garlic, potatoes. Um, and here are some pictures of uh, some of the plants just sort of starting off. And again, these are like, if you have them sort of around your classroom, they're really quick and easy to, you know, break off a leaf and try, give it a taste. Um, and as you have more of this, these experiences around, students get to become taste experts. Uh, we also have, as part of our resources, we have a little chart. So what we do with students is have them become taste experts and uh, create categories themselves of what they think the plant or the leaf would taste like um, and go through that process and it's pretty neat uh, neat process as well um, and also part of this is also just making them aware of food waste and how we can extend the growth of, of certain plants okay yeah so these are some examples of sprouting so you can sprout in mason jars uh, using mesh, um, or there's the sprouting tray kit that you could stack uh, one on top of the other. Okay, so we'll move on. All right, so um, we appreciate, I know it's after lunch, you know, I can see some faces just kind of crawling down. <laughs> um, but we're going to do more of an active uh, and experiential activity, okay? So you can see on the table, there's certain ingredients. You may know already because we've told you, but some of it is still unknown. Um, all right, so this is what we're going to do. So each person, there's a bowl with leafy greens. So I want you to grab maybe like one or two leafy greens onto your plate, OK? I want you to take a little bit of uh, maybe dip it in the vinaigrette or take some vinaigrette onto your plate, whatever uh, best works for you. So once you're ready to taste, I want you to close your eyes, okay? Yeah, I know, we're gonna do this, yes. I want you to take a bite out of it, whatever you have on the plate. Close your eyes and then I want you to think about the first thing that comes into your mind, whether that is a memory, some thought, idea, weird thing, whatever it is, okay? What does it remind you of? I want you to think about the texture, the color, the sauce, if it's your first time trying something like this, or if you've had it before, or if you don't know what the hell you're trying. <laughs> so this is just an example of what we do with children. And it's essentially exposing them in groups and eating together um, and sharing uh, about certain foods. Right, and some of the foods, like right now on your table, we we didn't get any from our tower garden, um, but it's once you have the tower garden or your outdoor space, um, it's putting that onto table. So it's farm to table, and then expose to them in many different ways. Whether you're doing a vinaigrette, whether uh, it's just smelling, whether it's just tasting, whether it's closing their eyes and a more experiential activity. Um, and getting their thoughts, just empathize with them, right? Um, and definitely from a lot of you guys here, uh, there's definitely different experiences, right? From loving it to like taste like grass to like, you know, um, to like summery taste, right? So it's taking that consideration in how you work with students, right? Especially around food and food literacy. 
Um, we'll move on to. Oh yeah, yeah. So another way that you could do this is um, some of you may have seen on the the pictures with uh, from the tower gardens. Um, Leafy greens, especially lettuce, you might get lettuce, like lettuce leaves that are like this big, right? And what do you do with that, right? So there's many different applications that you could, you could use with students. And one of them is like making a wrap, right? So actually utilizing what you have instead of going buying stuff at a gro grocery store. Um, and use as much as possible, herbs, other leafy greens. Uh, maybe in school cafeteria they might have s some food scraps or something else um, and utilizing that with students and making a wrap right and that in itself is also exposing them um, on their side of uh, food cooking or food skills right food capabilities that you may n perhaps not know that they're already getting at home but then from our experience we also know that they're not getting right and and that's a valuable item And uh, yeah, and it was really, really cool too. Like we were working with the uh, kindergarten class and um, we w one of the things that we do is we do a salad making workshop with the students um, and we'll, you know, have them, we'll have like a different, different types of leafy greens like chard, kale, lettuce, um, things that they haven't seen before. Callaloo, callaloo is a, uh, is a Caribbean uh, plant um, that folks may be not very familiar with. So just introducing them to different types of cultural foods um, and also having them just like look at it with their eyes, look at the colors, smell, taste, look at the texture. Um, you could turn that into an art activity. Uh, we have some students who dried uh, the leaves off their tower garden or their uh, gardens and um, you know wrote little descriptions about them or poetry about, uh, about them and things like that. Um, as well as what I wanted to say, um, yeah, so in terms of like the, the idea is that we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, get you to use simple ingredients, not not a lot of uh, having to shop for other things, but using what you have, um, but also in just introducing them to different types of like spices and herbs as well. Um, and a lot, yeah, going back to the kindergarten stu uh, class, so a lot of them, you know, they tried out some store-bought dressing and then they made their own and they saw the difference in that too and really enjoyed the uh the ones that they made themselves, right? Which has less of the uh, processed ingredients and more um, just simple, simple, ready, ready to go ingredients. Um, and a lot of them just asked for salad, just the greens, and they're like, no, no dressing. And that was a pretty neat, uh, neat uh, story. Uh, so yeah, so making dressing. So uh, ta talking to them about the foundation of the, you know, the basic ingredients like the oil, the vinaigrette. Um, you know, what makes uh, something sweet or sour and the different types of uh, seasoning and herbs. Um, and yeah, the next one up that we'd, we'd like you to try to, we have a pesto. Um, so this is a different recipe, but the pesto that we tried, we, uh, so it's the, the green uh, little sort of uh, paste there. Uh, we use kale, carrot, garlic, uh, oil, and salt and pepper. And those were the basic ingredients in that one. So you can use the cracker. The crackers are rice crackers, so they're they're gluten. The dark green, that's right. That's the pesto. So you can go ahead and use the cracker if you like, or just with your skewer again, if you'd like to um, try out the pesto, you know, give it a smell again. So as you're tasting that, I'm just we're just gonna run through this one quickly. But I just want to talk to you a little bit about herbs, right? So um, herbs are one of those uh, the plants that students don't know a lot about, but when you do introduce them to it, uh, they they do love learning more about it. Um, there are a lot of medicinal benefits uh, from herbs. So at your table, uh, you might also have some chamomile, uh, some nettle, um, so different types of herbs so you can ha smell that too. Nettle is one of the herbs that um, is very high in iron. Uh, so uh, recently we did a workshop w at an all-girls high school and we talked about the benefits of nettle, especially when um, you know, young girls are going through their menstrual cycle. Um, it's, a great, it's a great alternative, um, a healthy alternative. 
And same thing, we just go through the process of making the tea together, uh, blending the tea, learning about the different benefits of the tea, uh, the different types of tea, and, um, and enjoying it together. Uh, and usually what we do when we start off uh, sort of like any cooking type of workshop is we'll just give thanks to all, you know, like the bees and the insects and the pollinators that made this food possible, all the hands that were involved in preparing it and all of us together sharing, uh, sharing the meal together. Uh, so do you have nettle on your? Yes, so it's just nettle. Yeah, the, there are other tables that have chamomile um, and some other herbs. I can't remember them off the top of my head right now. Um, but there are certain things that, you know, like basil, mint, uh, oregano, those are things that can be easily grown in your classroom, right? Some of these, of course, are store-bought, um, but you can complement them with ones that you can grow yourself. Um, and we do have a handout that we'll leave here for you of the different types of uh, uh, tea, tea uh, combinations and what they're good for, um, whether it's cold or a sickness or stomach ache. Okay. Yeah, so we also do have, we have a herb tea workshop online, a herb butter workshop. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna, sorry about that. Uh, so we do have these resources available online as well. So if you were wanted to do something like a herb, herb tea or a herb butter workshop, it's uh, easy enough. The herb butter is really fun. Uh, what we actually do is we'll have students again in groups, working in groups. Um, we have a container, so you could have any container, a couple of marbles. They've been cleaned and sanitized. And all we use is uh, whipping cream, so like 35% whipping cream. Um, and uh, you can add some herbs, so whatever herbs, basil, mint, just tear them into little pieces and add them in. And uh, all they do is shake, shake, shake for a couple of minutes and they really enjoy that. We'll maybe try to put on a song like Taylor Swift, but she's not cool anymore apparently. Um, so you kind of have to, <laughs> I don't know, to some people she's not. So yeah, we tried, we did that one time, we were like shake, 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 and they're like, no, not having it. So anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So you do that for a little bit, and then you can also show them the process of the liquid turning into uh, solid, and then liquid, the liquid portion being the buttermilk. So that's a really cool process to walk them through as well. Um, and then they get to taste what they made. So they're always so excited about um, just tasting, uh, you know, tasting the, going through the process, but also tasting and sharing. Um, so that's an easy one that you could do as well. So, yeah, so that's just some pictures of our students trying out different types of herbs, going through the process. Um, and lastly, so we're just going to end. We have about five minutes. Uh, so if I can just get everyone's attention. <laughs> Yeah, so just in terms of how to connect this to the curriculum. So we just took out a few things. Um, and again, you could refer to our uh, website where we have a whole slew of lesson plans, fully developed lesson plans, um, and just start, like, use that as a base and then grow from there. Um, and you can add your own questions, your own follow-up activities or discussions to make it work for you. Um, and then we're also always, we're available by email or phone if you have a question about a certain workshop and you're like, I don't, how does this work? Um, we're happy to answer those questions for you. Um, so these are just some examples of some of the things, lesson plans, so like there's signature salads, Herbalicious Poetry, um, Can You Dig It, where we talk about wormy composting. Um, you can talk about the amount of sugar that is in some of the drinks that students have and then make a healthy smoothie together with, uh, you know, local ingredients. So those are just some examples. And, um, yeah, in terms of uh, making some curriculum, curriculum links, sorry, so like a grade one, you could talk about pa math and patterning and algebra, um, just matching up leaves based on their size, color, or texture, using it as an art activity as well. Um, grade five science, understanding like basic concepts of the of the human structure. Um, you know, have students create a diagram about what happens to salad in their bodies when they eat 
uh, when they eat it. Um, there's also for for grades uh, for high school students primarily media studies. So this is uh, if you're using um, oils like the vinaigrette, you can actually get them activating to creating uh, like for instance their own brands um, and using appropriate forms and techniques. So using technology as well, like different programs if they're available. Um, and grade 11 is having more of like a cultural appropriation of different foods, where they're coming from, how are they produced, uh, preserved, transformed, and is engaging them again into have more of like a critical thinking, more of discussion, um, and also representing their own cultural identities, right? Um, and sharing a lot of that stories. So um, that's a bit from our end. If you guys have any questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have some resources that, if you want, uh, we've printed out some forms of Herbalicious teas that are in each one's table. But this is a more detailed description, um, and some calendars. Oh, we're gonna leave them over there, around the healthy kids. Uh, but if you if you feel adventurous, come by to the vermicompost and get to see some of the warm cast.